Okay, movie, I didn't send your opening logo because there's only one and it only lasts 20 seconds. But this opening title shot lasts for fucking ever. And this one you've earned. Jeremy thinks two minutes is forever. Hey, hey, easy on the fluids, pal. The rubber sheets are packed. If Fuller seriously has a bedwetting problem, then why couldn't you leave one rubber sheet out? If there isn't a rubber sheet available, it'll motivate Fuller to not drink as much. Theoretically, anyways. Why do we have to go to Florida? There's no Christmas trees in Florida. Kevin, what is it with you and Christmas trees? Why do they have to go anywhere? I know we have to make a sequel and all, but this family put Kevin through some severe trauma just a year ago, and now they want to go through the same machinations? All things considered, Kevin's handling this amazingly well. The best way to get over your fear is to confront it, not avoid it. After all, this is how Kevin got over his fear of the basement. And old man Marley. Bonnie, do you know where the battery for this camcorder is? Yeah, I put it in the charger. Okay, the last time this happened, it was a storm that knocked the power out. But this time, it's Kevin's dad, who is so reckless with his plug behavior here that I assume he's actively trying to lose Kevin. Also, why did he need to unplug the splitter box at all? He was just disconnecting the camcorder battery charger, which is on the underside of this obvious fire hazard. It's easier to pull the plug out if you're pulling on the splitter as well. Similar to taking a cork out of a bottle. Also, I can hear somebody fumbling with something in the background of that sin. I can't quite tell what it is, but something else is going on there. Why are Kevin and Buzz singing in the same choir? Sure, they might both be enrolled in this school, but Kevin's in the third grade, and Buzz is definitely in high school. This choir probably contains the best singers in the entire school, rather than in any particular grade. Buzz is on the top row, so this shove should just knock him off the risers. But because we're meant to believe that Kevin ruins everything, the entire choir is taken out. But you can see in the clip that Buzz accidentally, or intentionally to give Kevin more blame, brings down these two with him. Which caused them to do the same to the people next to them. Before her employment at St. Gerard's school, this music teacher clearly worked at the Prometheus School of Running Away From Things. The teacher didn't know the tree was coming down on her until it was too late. If I had my own money, I'd go on my own vacation. Well, you got your wish last year, maybe you'll get it again this year. Listen, Kevin's being a bit of a dick here, but Kate's literally displaying the same passive aggressiveness as last year, despite knowing exactly how that all worked out. Jeremy, this is how parents talk to their kids if they want to stay calm. And her tone isn't what caused Kevin to be left behind. Why are Kevin's parents the only ones in this entire f***ing house that have an alarm? They're the motherfuckers that are responsible for waking the whole family up, and with their track record, they're still designated for this role. Okay, I'll admit that it makes no sense for a rich family to only have one alarm clock. However, you can't say they've had a bad track record when, as far as we know, they only screwed up once. And on top of that, it was the power going out that caused the alarm to turn off. Not their own negligence. How come none of us are sitting together? At this time of year, we're lucky to get on the same plane. F***ing what? How is it even possible that none of them are sitting next to each other, even by accident? There's f***ing 14 of them. Most planes can carry up to 850 passengers, so if anything, it's more unlikely for 14 people, who chose their seats at random, to be next to each other. And even if we pretend that wasn't true, Kate is later seen next to Peter and in front of Frank and Leslie. So Megan was only referring to the McAllister children flying in coach when she says, How come none of us are sitting together? Reinforcing my theory that Kevin's dad is actively trying to ditch him, Kevin's allowed to run behind the entire family, without anyone looking back for him, despite the events of the last movie. They're in a hurry. Don't worry, man, we'll get everybody on the plane. Okay, I realize this is the early 90s and they didn't have the sophistication that modern airports do now, but they do have a f***ing manifest, right? There's definitely a ticket, and therefore a person, missing from this flight. Assuming that this is correct, what are you expecting them to do? They can't delay the plane because of a single passenger. Jesus Christ, movie. I know you're trying to cram in all the interesting spots in New York City, but Kevin just went from Midtown to Chelsea, then walked from there down to Chinatown, which is all the way in Lower Manhattan, then went to Battery Park at the southernmost part of the island. Was anyone paying attention to the practical realities of this movie? He probably used a taxi to get around. They just used a jump cut to move the story along. Kevin has now apparated all the way up to Central Park, because nothing means anything, and f looking at an actual map if you work on this movie. And yes, he could be using taxis to get around, but there's not one to be seen after he rides in from the airport. So you think we have to see Kevin use a taxi to prove he didn't just teleport? Do you know what a jump cut is? Excuse me, where's the lobby? Down the hall and to the left. Also, why is Trump looking back at Kevin? In fact, why is anyone looking at this kid? In New York, some kid walking around by himself wouldn't even be in the top 100 of weirdest things seen that day for most of these people. It's still weird to see a kid by himself dressed like this at the Plaza Hotel. 
at least weird enough that you would at least take a glance. This is Peter McAllister. The father. Not in a million years would Chris Columbus's wife fall for this trick. Name a more fake sounding voice. This is Peter McAllister. The father. Yes, sir. I'd like a hotel room, please. Yes. With if you needed any more proof that Kevin grows up to be Jigsaw and or the Collector, here it is. I could just say that this sin is pointless and dumb, and I will, but I'm also going to take this time to debunk the Kevin is Jigsaw theory. I know I'm not the first to do this, but I'm doing it anyway. Kevin states that he is 10 years old in this movie. I'm 10 years old. We can infer from this credit card machine that the film takes place in 1992. In Saw 3 and 4, which take place at the same time as each other, Jigsaw dies. According to this fingerprint sheet, the films take place in 2006. During John Kramer's autopsy, the coroner says he's 52. Subject's name is John Kramer. 52-year-old male, Caucasian. So there's no way Kevin went from 10 to 52 in 14 years. And on top of that, in Home Sweet Home Alone, Kevin is revealed to be pranking the police every year. Listen, when I was a kid, my family went on vacation. We forgot my little brother, Kevin. Twice. He called in the 289 to mess with me. The idiot does it every year. The date on this phone says Thursday, December 23rd. December 23rd this year will definitely be a Thursday. And this movie does not take place before 2010. And Kevin has to be alive to prank call the police. Cedric. Yes? Don't count your tips in public. I know I'm going hard at this movie, and it deserves it. But I'm taking a sin off for Tim Curry, who's a national f***ing treasure. And I don't care that he's English. We're claiming it. Very good. What he said. The Yikes! Movie makes yet another lazy ass joke about Kevin's swimsuit coming off during the cannonball, despite clearly showing that it stayed on after he hit the water. It could have come off in between shots. Even if we ignore the fact that there's no way a household product from the 90s can record audio this perfectly over the sound of a shower. Things Frank said before and after Kevin left the bathroom are on the tape. Harry's vision comes with its own zoom and enhance cliche. This is not a zoom and enhance. This is a zoom. A zoom is a common filmmaking tactic to show what a character is focusing on. I suppose you could call it a cliche? But at that point, you might as well call the steady cam, tracking shot, reverse shot, or crane shot a cliche. Look who it is, Marv. Harry's revenge boner is so strong he doesn't even notice what a massive coincidence this situation is. Have you ever heard the saying, don't look a gift horse in the mouth? <laughs> a ton of people were just walking in this area, but somehow Harry and Marv are the only ones that can't avoid the pratfall. If by tons of people you mean, like, two or three. And they weren't even on the spot with the most marbles. Hey, 
looking for somebody to read you a bedtime story? This prostitute is extremely comfortable with propositioning a 10-year-old. Yeah, pedophiles exist. This is great! Not only is this sinful for romanticizing New York City pigeons, and seriously, f*** those pigeons. This is way too much pigeon stuff in this story about a runaway child being pursued by two criminals. The movie barely even talks about the pigeons. The pigeons are just something the bird lady likes. You might as well say the first film had too many shovels. Say goodbye to your birds for me. Or you could do it. You're f***ing standing right by them. Kevin was quipping. He was jokingly implying that the pigeons can only understand pigeon lady. You can mess with a lot of things, but you can't mess with kids on Christmas. So if this had been Easter, Kevin would have just said, f*** those kids, and gone on his merry way. No. Also, what was that sound I just heard? So if, 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 casual breaking and entering is casual. Desperate times call for desperate measures. He's in full view of the entire street, which is the affluent and crowded Upper West Side, by the way, but nobody sees this future horror movie villain going about his business here. Did you see it? I'll play it again. He's in full view of the entire street, which is the affluent and crowded Upper West Side, by the way, but nobody sees this future horror movie villain going about his business here. Right after Jeremy says affluent, for a fraction of a second, the sin counter goes up by one, and then fixes itself. It's Christmas Eve, and because of you, our child is lost in one of the biggest cities in the world. Um, not to overstate the obvious, but this is some serious blame shifting. This is like saying the drive through guy at Taco Bell made you fat. But it was their fault. Instead of confronting him calmly about the credit card, asking him what's going on, and making sure he stays in the hotel, they decided to intimidate and chase Kevin. Not to beat Kevin's geographical abilities into the ground, but how did he know how to get from where he was to the toy store? Last time, he got here in a limo from a completely different location. Do you know what a map is? Wow, this solid concrete floor just magically tilted so that Marv could slide into this bookcase. That's not a bookcase. That's a shelving stack. I didn't know they were called that either. What's that sound? Hey, maybe move out of the way instead of going, I wonder what that noise is. I mean, it's not like we're in a building full of traps. I know where he is. I need to get to Rockefeller Center. Sure, Kate knows that the biggest Christmas tree in the city is at Rockefeller Center, but how does Kevin know that? And how does she know that he knows? Did you miss the setup for this earlier in the movie? Why do we have to go to Florida? There's no Christmas trees in Florida. Kevin, what is it with you and Christmas trees? How could you have Christmas without a Christmas tree, Mom? How'd you know I was here? Well, I know you and Christmas trees, and this is the biggest one around. Where's everybody else? They're at the hotel. They didn't like palm trees either. It isn't possible I can see all of them. Can I just see my mother? Kevin's praying to this Christmas tree instead of literally calling his mother on the phone or reaching out to really anyone in an authority position. As far as we know, nobody in this movie has a cell phone. And Kevin doesn't know where his family is staying. Yeah, yeah, magical Christmas magic and sh**, but come the hell on. How in the world would Duncan be able to track Kevin down to the plaza, figure out how many kids are there, their ages, and then be able to mobilize this amount of giftage? I'll give you Duncan knowing what to give, but Duncan knows where Kevin is because of the letter. Considering what Kevin just put his family through, he could have at least let them know what he was doing. Maybe he did. Just because we don't see him tell his family that he's about to leave doesn't mean he didn't. I feel like I've had way too many sins in that same ballpark throughout this video. Kevin! You spent $967 on road service! There is no way Peter's yells are audible from all the way down here.